starting a new series on the book of James today. I love the book of James. It's in the New Testament. If you have a Bible, turn to James chapter 1. You can make some noise. You can shout. You can scream. We are turning to James chapter 1. It's page 1,414 in my Bible. I don't know what page number it is in your Bible, but it's near the end of the Bible. And the reason why I wanted to do a series on James is because this guy... He was a brother to Jesus, or half-brother. He had the same mother, Mary, uh, and then his biological father was Joseph. We know Jesus was conceived supernaturally, was the son of God. But James grew up watching his brother, Jesus, uh, went to his birthday parties, homeschooled together, learned carpentry together, kind of struggled at first to believe that his brother was the son of God, But at the crucifixion, the Bible says James, somewhere along the journey, he was a little late to the party, but once he put his faith in his brother, recognizing that his brother Jesus was the son of God, he became a like total follower and went on to write one of the most powerful books in the New Testament. Chronologically speaking, the book of James, most scholars believe, was the first book written in the New Testament, even though it's placed further in the New Testament after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Romans and Acts and and all of the Pauline epistles. But James was one of these guys that he pastored the church. In fact, the very first church that started out of Pentecost in Jerusalem, 3,000 people get saved. James was the pastor of Jerusalem Church, St. James Cathedral, right? St. James. He was this guy that loved pastoring people and preaching practical truth. So he was trying to help people to understand this faith we have is not some, you know, difficult, complicated message to follow is very practical. And we need to understand when we read the book of James, we're not reading a book that's for people who've not been saved. We're not reading a book on how to get saved. James is not writing, you know, rules to enter into salvation. Jesus didn't say, clean yourself up, then you can follow me, right? Behave and then you'll get saved. No, no, no. Jesus says, follow me and I'll clean you. Follow me and I'll change your life. But Jesus doesn't require us to purchase our salvation through good works. And this is important for us to understand. James is not telling us how to be saved. He's telling us what it looks like after you're saved to walk this thing out. Somebody say, walk it out. Walk it out. Walk it out. James was saying, practice what you preach. Once you understand you are saved, something in your life should start to change. Something should start to grow in your life. The fruits of the Holy Spirit should start to become evident because this isn't just an altar call. We pray and then that's it. He says, this is meant to be a life we live. So James chapter one, verse one, I'm going to read all the way to verse 12 and then we're going to back up and talk through it. James chapter one, verse one. He says, my name is James. I am a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this book is for the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. We'll come back to that. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, <laughs> because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away just like the flowers. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. But blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today, God, and that we would leave different than the way we came in with our faith and our hope and our trust in you and our hearts being renewed by your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. So there was a research done on bumblebees a long time ago, 
and they took bumblebees to outer space. Some of y'all want to send some other people to outer space, but they took bumblebees to outer space, and they, they tried to see if bumblebees could float without, with the, the change of the gravity. And what happened was these bumblebees floated with ease for a long time. They didn't have to flap their wings. They were just floating in the air. And it was pretty amazing for these scientists who were watching it. It was easy for life up there for the bumblebees. No struggle, no flapping the wings, no toil, no adversity, no resistance. But after a few days, something strange happened. On the fourth day, all the bumblebees died. They loved the easiness of not having to work hard, not having to toil, no adversity. But the problem was bumblebees were created for resistance. In the same way, you and I as humans, we were created to go through adversity and trouble and difficulties, even though we hate it, even though it's not fair, even though resistance is not fun. It is through this resistance, James says, God is doing something powerful in the midst of your trials. The reason you go through these things is not because God wants to end your life, destroy your life, ruin your life. I remember being at my mom's house one day, and this guy was in the backyard, and he was cutting her green tree. She had this green, like an evergreen tree, and this guy starts coming in during springtime, April. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he starts cutting this thing left and right. Edward Scissorhands just cutting this thing off. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. And I go out there. I go, you are killing her tree. He said, no, 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 no. I'm preparing it to thrive. I said, what? He said, if a tree doesn't go through proper pruning, these kinds of trees, they get crazy. And he said, the right pruning will actually cause these branches to get more lush, more strong, more thriving, more vibrant, more powerful. And I was like, there's a sermon in this. This is what James is saying. He's saying, listen, when you go through trials of many kinds, and there are many kinds of trials. How many of y'all know there's many kinds of trials? Last night, I came home after church, and I'm pulling up to our house, and I see this little girl running around in a princess dress. Now, we have five kids. So I was like, oh, that's one of our five. You know, she's out there in a princess dress. It was Gianna. She's almost three years old. And I see her running. I was like, why is she running? And she's hiding behind a bush. And I was like, I wonder what she's doing out there. So I, I start to get out of my car. Next thing I know, all five kids have prepared with weapons and water balloons, including my wife, to attack me after church. And I had a rough message last night. Like, I, I, was, I was like, I just need some comfort, some convenience. I just need somebody to say it's going to get better tomorrow. But y'all, the family came after me. It was trials of many kinds. I got water balloons in the face. I got, I mean, Mac had boxing gloves on. He just starts punching me right, right where it counts. And then Ellie and Gianna are in their princess dresses, and they're running around, and they're throwing things at me. Liam has this intense gun, like... We got them dart guns. This dart gun is high pressure. He had it on the highest pressure possible, which, by the way, I have my own gun this morning. I came for some revenge. Where are... Oh, no, Jesus, help me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> get, get out of here. No, 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 no. <laughs> hey, we're not doing this right now. Stop, 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 stop. Stop it. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well... I did not count on that. I heard that he was looking for me. And then I found out why. So then I got prepared as any wise person would do. And you married a smart woman. <laughs> Come on, give it up for Ashley. I was not ready. I, was, I did. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to continue the fight. <laughs> but here's one thing I've realized about these super soakers is the more pressure, the more power. The more tension and the more buildup, the more it begins to operate with the power that it was intended to operate in. But that power is not released until it's pressurized. And then I realized this is beautiful because no mess, no ministry. 
No, no problems, no people in the house. As long as there's people in the house, there's going to be problems. At some point, these kids grow up, they move out. And I remember my mentor told me, he said, Paul, these are the best days ever. And I, this is when I found out we were pregnant with our fifth kid and I fainted. And I did. I was like, it was a COVID surprise and we weren't ready for it. And I, I, me and Ash, I was just overwhelmed. And I called Pastor Larry Stockstill and he said, Paul, these are the days you will laugh about later on. He's like, learn to laugh right now. And you go through things in your life that you feel like you're not prepared for. Some of them are happy surprises. Some of them are not happy surprises. Some of them are being ambushed by your family with water balloons and guns. Some of them are being ambushed by your family, literally. I mean, you think about Joseph, ambushed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold as a slave. And if James could talk to Joseph in the Old Testament, James would say, Joseph, consider it pure joy. And you're like, are you kidding me? Who are you to tell me that this is a joyful situation? My brothers just tried to kill me. They sold me as a slave. I got accused of a crime I didn't commit. And you're telling me to rejoice in this adversity, in these trials? You're telling me that what happened with Potiphar and his wife is something to be happy about? James is not saying smile and, and be like shallow happy. He's saying Rejoice in the fact that God is doing something in you that can only happen through a pruning season. There are certain things that only happen in our life when we walk through adversity. Growth doesn't happen when life is good. Growth happens when life is hard. Someone gave me a, a painting after my dad passed and after we had walked through some trials as a church. And someone gave me this painting, and I'll never forget, it was eight years ago. And the painting said, a smooth sea never made a skillful sailor. And I hung the painting up in my office, and I thought, I wish I had a different painting to hang up in my office. Because this painting is not an exciting thing to think about. I remember talking with one of the people that served as president of Oral Roberts University several years ago, Dr. Rutland. He said, Pain is the greatest teacher for leadership. When you walk through adversity and pain and cutting and trials and difficulty, either because of your own personal mistakes or because of other people's choices or because of life being unfair, it's in those trials that God is up to something. And if we can change our perspective about trials... I want to just give you three ways to change your perspective about trials because this is where James is starting his book. He's going to get into some real practical truths. He's going to talk about what it looks like to live out our salvation. But the first thing he deals with is difficulties because America is obsessed with comfort and convenience. If we could have comfort every day, all day, we would. We're, we're the country that like craves comfort. Did you know right now um, there are the, the, the pills that help take pain away? Are, are literally now a, like, I think I heard $500 billion industry of what people will pay to get rid of pain, what people will pay to not have pain in their back, pain in their neck, pain at sleeping. All of the pain pill medicate people are obsessed with getting rid of pain. And what James says is we need to change our perspective about pain. Not that pain is like a gift from God, because God is not the author of bad things. In fact, in James chapter 1, I want to just point this out to you. Verse 16, James says, don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters in the church. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. We need to know God is not the author of terrible things. God did not send cancer into your life to teach you a lesson. God did not put your parents through a divorce to teach you a lesson. God did not give you an abusive family member to teach you. There are people who actually believe a theology that God is the author of pain in your life. He's not. They go, well, what about Job? God didn't send pain to Job. God allowed pain to happen, but God in the end had the final say over Job's future. Don't you forget, like God is not the author of the sickness in your life and the pain. Well, I think God sent COVID to teach us a lesson. We need to understand every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above who does not change, James says. He does not change like shifting shadows. God wants to give us life and life more abundantly. But God will allow things to happen in our lives that we don't understand. That doesn't mean he sent it. 
It just means it's a part of life. And one of the ways that we approach our trials, James says, is to approach it with a perspective that requires contemplation. So the first thing that I would just say in changing your perspective of your problems is contemplation. Take time to think about this trial. Take time. James' first word says consider. Consider, contemplate this trial. Contemplate this trial from the perspective that God wants to produce joy in your life. That God wants to produce something greater than shallow Christianity. That God wants to produce a staying power. Can God trust you with trouble? Can God trust you with a trial? Can God allow you to walk through something that you don't understand, either caused by you or caused by others or caused by our nation or the world or caused by the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, right? Can God trust us to walk through these trials and to contemplate that this is an opportunity to grow? This is an opportunity to become more like him. Secondly, supplication. In verse 5, James says, as you're contemplating these trials and recognizing this is a time not to rejoice that it's happening, but to rejoice that God is doing something in you, bring your prayer to God. Supplication just means to talk to God about it. If 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 you're in a time where life is hard, it's raining outside. I remember walking out of ORU one day. I was a student there, and it was pouring rain, just intense, heavy rainstorm, right? By the way, yesterday, Oklahoma had 45 mile hour winds yesterday. How many of y'all felt the wind, the pressure, the pressure, the pressure? Oklahoma, where the wind comes sweeping down the plains, where the waving, we, we were outside and me and the kids, we were getting blown away by the wind. We were running against the wind and the wind was pushing us back. It was intense. We would throw the football in the air and it would literally, the wind blew it the other way. And in these moments, James says, ask God for help. I was walking out of that ORU chapel. It was pouring rain. And I thought I had to walk through the rain to get to the GC where the student center is, where my next class was. It's about a football field of walking through the rain. As I'm trying to press through this crowd of people with umbrellas, I see someone who's not only holding an umbrella, blocking the rain from touching them. They have another umbrella in their hand, just holding it there. And I was afraid to ask for it because I was like, I don't know them. They don't know me. Why would I ask for that? But something inside me after getting soaked in the rain for about 10 seconds was like, I'm going to ask. And I went over. I said, can I borrow your extra umbrella? They were like, sure. I brought an extra one in case someone needed. I was like, praise God. (laughs) James says, if you lack wisdom, (laughs) ask God for help. James as a pastor, remember, he's pastoring the church in Jerusalem. And by the way, after his friend Stephen got martyred at the hands of Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul. After that happened, the church scattered. The 12 tribes of Jewish converts who had given their lives to Jesus, it scattered. So James is talking to a group of people who are walking through persecution at the hands of of the Roman Empire, the Pharisees, the, the people who hate Christianity during that time. And James says... When you're walking through these trials, don't feel like you have to do it by yourself and don't feel like God doesn't want to help you. Bring your supplication. Thirdly, expectation. In verse six through eight, expect God to help you. Expect God to deliver on his promises. Don't doubt. Don't be a double-minded person. I was talking with Pastor Ty about just this revelation of when James says in verse six, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Everybody say, don't doubt. Tell them real quick just that thought behind doubt and double-mindedness. Well, what I, we were talking about is we've all had thoughts of doubt. How many's had thoughts of doubt? What James is teaching us here, I believe, is he's trying to tell us, hey, even in verse 12, he said there's going to be temptations come. You're going to be tempted to doubt. But what he's saying is we've got to be solid and we've got to grow up in the word where we're not wavering and doubting because then we become double-minded, which is a very serious word. It's the Greek word dysikos, which means two-spirited. A spirit of faith and unbelief, but a spirit of doubt. And he's saying, grow past that. I've had a lot of thoughts of doubt, but just because I have a thought of doubt does not mean I'm in doubt. And I've got to stand on the truth and stand on it no matter what I see, no matter what I feel, no matter what I hear. All of those things are subject to change, but I'm going to stand on the word which never changes. Come on, come on. Sign up for discipleship class this week. By the way, we do an amazing discipleship class for men and women. It's 12 weeks or 11. 
12 weeks long. Jesus had disciples for three years, and even after three years, they ran from him. One of them betrayed him. I think we got to realize, and I believe in our 12-week discipleship class, I'm a graduate of it. How many of y'all graduated from our discipleship class? But we never graduate from being disciples. A disciple is a learner. It's a, it's a person who studies and follows and wants to keep growing and wants to keep being teachable. We don't graduate from the class of learning to be a follower of Jesus. This is why as a church, we could preach about topics and I could say, but I feel like we're in a time where the church needs to go line by line, precept by precept, verse by verse to understand the Bible so that we can be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. So James says, expect God to move. Don't be double minded. Don't be doubtful. Don't like it's okay to have questions and thoughts like Pastor Ty said, but don't let that turn your heart in a place of unbelief towards God. God wants us to believe in his promises. And here's what God wants to do through these trials. You know, I joked about the the super soaker, but here's what I've realized about this super soaker. I'm going to get this thing back out. I'm looking for Ashley to come back into the room from the restroom, right? (laughs) No pressure, no power. The more pressure there is, the more power this thing has. And the more power this thing has, the more impact it can make and the more farther it can go. Same thing with a bow and arrow. The farther the arrow needs to launch, the more pressure and resistance it has to have in the pullback. God is is allowing these things to happen so that you can walk in greater impact, greater influence, greater uh, release in what God's called you to do. So here's what God uses these trials to produce. Number one, he uses these trials to produce real joy, real joy, not just fake joy, but real joy, learning to sing in the rain, learning to dance in the rain. Our response to our trials is more important than trying to avoid the trials. James says, how you respond, consider it pure joy. There's real joy that's happening in the middle of this adversity. I wrote this down here. What what are the benefits of trials and pressure, even just on things we see out in the world? Think about when grapes are pressed, when they are crushed, when they go through that crushing process. We see this in Napa Valley. Wine is produced from the pressing and the crushing of grapes, Olives, when they go through a crushing and a pressing and an intense time of, 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 of trial, they, go, they turn into olive oil. Carbon, when carbon is pressurized with high heat, high temperature, it produces diamonds. No pressure, no diamonds. No pressure, no power. No pressure, no potency. No cutting, no thriving. On the other side of our trials, James says God is up to something and he's producing real joy. I remember one night I had just walked through so many trials and I had cried as many tears as I could cry until my tears started turning into tears of joy. And it wasn't joy over the trial. It was joy that God was with me, that God was working in me, that God was producing something in me. Notice that James introduces himself in the very first verse as a servant. One of the greatest joys is the joy of being a servant in God's house. But you don't come to that joy when you approach God with an entitlement mentality. We're living in a time where people want to erase the word servant. Customer service has gone out the window. Since COVID, people are like, do it yourself, you know. Get your own food out of the kitchen. We're like, yeah, but, but you're the waiter. I don't, you want me to go back there and get the cook, you know. But, 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 but we're living in a time where people want to be served instead of serve. And James could have said, I am James, the half-brother of Jesus I was born in the family, saw him walk on water at his birthday party, watched Jesus heal the blind eyes. But James says, I'm James, a servant of the Lord. The greatest joy that we can find in this life is serving God. The greatest title we can have in this life is servant. It's not CEO. It's not pastor. This joy that God's producing is bringing us into number two, real patience, real patience. What are these trials producing in our life? Patience or perseverance. You could put either one. Patience is long suffering. It's learning to wait. James is going to talk about it in in chapter two and three and four and five as the farmer waits for his harvest, waiting with expectancy, waiting and trusting that God will deliver what he promised he would deliver. 
I want the the keys to come out because we're going to go into worship here in just a moment. But God uses these trials to produce patience. None of us in the room pray for patience. None of us are like, oh, God, bless me with great patience this year. But when God leads us through trials, he produces patience. Job had to learn in the Bible to wait on God's redemption. And in the end, Job repented. He said, God, I got angry at you and I was wrong. These things are higher than I can think of. These things are deeper than I can understand. How can I even fathom the ways of God? I was speaking out of a place of impulsive demanding. We serve a crockpot God, but we have a microwave faith. We want hot pockets in our miracles. We want, we want to just push 30 seconds and get, okay, God, do the miracle. Do the, like, we want you to fix the problems now. And God says, this is going to take some time. I'm learning how to cook, and I'm enjoying it. And, and one thing that you know, I'm learning is if I put spaghetti noodles in a boiling pot and throw them in there, if I put those strands of spaghetti noodles in that pot and just put them in there for 20 seconds and pull them out and go, okay, kids, spaghetti's ready. They're going to start eating. They're like, Daddy, it's not ready yet. You got to leave it in there longer. Some of us are trying to pull the the cookies out of the oven too soon. We're trying to pull the spaghetti. We're trying to pull the the steak off the grill before it's had time to cook and marinate. God wants us to stay in that place of patience, long suffering. God's James says, understand that these trials are producing in you perseverance. Thirdly, he says they're producing in you maturity. God uses trials to produce spiritual maturity, humility, humility. God's using these things to take us deeper as Christians. There's things that we go through in one season that make a, a, that are a huge deal to us, and 10 years later, they're not as huge of a deal. What's happened? Spiritual maturity. We've learned to handle trials with a greater level of wisdom because we walk through it. Life will preach to you, and if you don't listen, it'll preach the same sermon over and over. And, and anyone been there before? You're like, okay, God, this is the fifth sermon in this lesson that I've now learned. <laughs> And I feel like this is, as a dad, I'm learning this with our kids. We're watching our kids and we're like, okay, you've learned this. Maybe you haven't learned this. We're gonna keep helping you to learn this. And as a good father in heaven, God's saying, I want you to grow. I I know we're not saved by our works and James is not saying that. He's saying, but as you are living your salvation out, there should be a spiritual growth. There should be a maturity that begins to form through the trials you've walked through. Number four, these trials produce character. Character. James is gonna talk about what that character looks like. And he, and he says there's some people who will sit in a message, they'll hear the message, they'll walk out and they won't apply any of it. He says it's like someone who looks in the mirror, walks away and forgets what they even looked like. And, and, and we gotta start with the man in the mirror. We gotta look in the mirror and say, God, the word of God looks at us and says, all right, your mouth needs to clean up. Your thoughts need to clean up. The way you treat people, don't show favoritism. To James, there's 108 verses in the book of James, and there are 60 punches in the face, like healthy, loving punches, like grown. <laughs> okay, maybe not a punch in the face, but just like a, hey, come on, like a good brother. Just say, come on, bro, step it up. Somebody say, step it up. James is not angry at us. He's not angry at the church. He's saying, come on, church. We weren't born to stay as one-year-olds our entire life. We were born to develop as a two-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old, 10-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old. We've got to mature. And he says, these trials are doing something that a season without trials can't do. The reward you get for overcoming your last challenge is another challenge. The reward we get for walking through one trial is God trusts us with the next trial. But with each trial, God allows us to grow and he produces spiritual maturity. Jesus promised in John 16, 33, in this world, you will have trouble. It's inevitable. We will have trials. It's not inevitable that we will triumph over those trials. That's up to us. You either get bitter or you get better. But real character is produced when we lean into God and say, God, work in me. I remember when I was in 10th grade and I was dating a girl and she broke up with me by kissing another guy and uh, telling me that she's now dating another guy. That's how the breakup happened. And I was upset about it. And that next day after the breakup, I walk outside to my car. My car has been broken into, glass is broken, and someone had stolen all of my CDs. You guys remember CDs back in the day? 
rest in peace CDs, but I had, I had 200 CDs. My stereo system was pulled out of my car. I had just bought this car. I'd saved up all my lawn mowing money for it. They stole my Bible. Who steals a Bible? They stole my Bible. They stole my wallet. I left my wallet in the car. And, and so then I, that, that next week I was driving that car and I had just gotten the stereo replaced. Someone had like a hundred dollar stereo I was able to put in there. It wasn't nice, but it was enough to, to get the music blaring. And I was listening to Creed. You guys remember Creed? And I was listening to this song, can you take me higher? And I'm driving and I'm just upset about life. And I ram into, I accident, I didn't mean to. I was coming over the hill at 91st and, and Sheridan between 91st and 101st or, uh, or on 101st and Sheridan between Sheridan and Memorial. I'm coming over this hill and I can't see. And I hit y'all, I hit the car of the new boyfriend of my ex-girlfriend. It was, and my friend Daniel Henshaw was with me in the car. We were both jamming out to Creed, and we were like, and his car hit another car, which hit another car. It was a five-car pileup. They all looked back at me. I was like, my bad. (laughs) And then her new boyfriend gets out of the car. He's like, are you jealous? Did you try to kill me because you're jealous? I was like, no, I didn't try to kill you. I'm sorry. And he's like, you're crazy, man. You're crazy. I was like, oh, no, I'm sorry. And that week, I found out my insurance skyrocketed through the roof. My insurance agent was like, you're an idiot. I don't know what you were thinking. This was bad. You're 16 years old. This is terrible. I remember just going home. I was like, I lost my girlfriend. I lost my friends. I lost my car. lost my sound system. And I literally fell to my knees. I was like, naked I came into this earth, and naked I shall leave. (laughs) Woe is me. (laughs) Blessed be the name of the Lord. But... I don't know where I'm going with this story. The point is, we all have trials of many kinds. Just because you're not 16 years old doesn't mean you should diminish a 16-year-old's trials, okay? We all have trials in different seasons. There's single people trials, married people trials, uh, married people with kids, married people without kids. We all have different kinds of trials. James says, in the middle of your trials, count it all joy that God's doing something in you. During that season, I started serving in the children's church and I stopped focusing on so many of the things that I was consumed by, a stereo system, a girlfriend, all these things. And it was in that season I sat down on the piano and I started writing my first worship song, I'm All Yours, Search Me, O oh God. And I remember that, that season, God was producing in me character. He was producing in me. It's in those seasons where we lose a lot of things and we lose a lot of stuff that we were leaning on and there's no more crutches that we learn how to depend on God. And honestly, I cherish the seasons where I've walked through my deepest heartbreak and pain because those seasons, even though they're really painful, it's in those seasons that I grow up. It's in those seasons that I stop living so shallow. Because when you're on the mountaintop, you don't have to think about it. But when you're in the valley, that's where you really learn to trust in God and you learn to embrace the pruning season. You go, okay, God, Cut away the pride. Cut away the dependency on riches. James says, if you're rich, don't lean on it because one day it all fades away. And if you're poor, take pride in the fact that you're rich in God. And if you're going through humble circumstances, embrace it because God's producing real joy. I've been to countries where kids had nothing, no shoes, no shirt, no problems. All they had was a pair of shorts just running through garbage city, Mexico running through garbage city Philippines, areas in in different parts of the world where people are impoverished and they are smiling and laughing and worshiping and rejoicing and handing out a bag of beans for that week and handing out a bag of rice that will last their family that week. You can be poor and be joyful. You can be rich and be miserable. You can be rich and be joyful. You can be poor and be miserable. It's not the circumstances that produces your character. It's how you handle the circumstances. It's how you respond to the trials. It's what you do in the middle of it. Do you stay immature or do you lean in and say, God, develop in me what you need to develop? No mess, no ministry. Number five, last point here. God uses these trials to produce genuine faith. God always uses our trials for good. The enemy uses our trials to accomplish evil, hopefully, but God uses our trials to produce good things genuine faith genuine faith many times I look back in college where our our professors would give us a test sometimes a pop quiz and they would say okay put your notes away clear your desk pull out your number two pencil 
It's test time. Surprise test. And the teacher would get quiet. The professor would say, I'm going to be over here. I'm not going to talk. And you can't ask me questions. But I'm in the room. And I remember those times where I would get so frustrated because I wouldn't know answers on the test. And I would feel so shocked by the test that I was having to to do here. And I, I was thinking, I don't know this and I need your help right now. And after the test, the teacher would then walk me through where I missed it, how I missed it, and how to get better. And the next test, I would be a little bit better for the next test. And the next test, I would be a little bit better. And this is what God does. He walks us through these tests and he never leaves us nor forsakes us, but he produces great things. In verse 12, this is what James says. He says, blessed is the man or woman who perseveres during their trials and tests. Having stood through the test that they walked through, that person will receive a crown. Now I got a a cheap crown here. Pastor Ty, can I borrow you one more moment to wear this crown? Yeah, look at that crown. No pressure, no diamonds. But the crown is not meant to stay on our head. The crown, John in the book of Revelation says that these crowns go back to the feet of Jesus. So Ty's one day going to receive the crown, but then he's going to take it off and say, God, thank you for the pleasure of being your servant. Thank you for letting me serve at Victory Church. Thank you for letting me serve through the trials that I walked through. Thank you for letting me walk through some tests that I didn't understand in my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, 50s, 60s. But God, you were there and you were producing in me real genuine faith, real character. And one day Ty will lay that crown. Who knows? Maybe the solar eclipse leads to the rapture of the church. I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe we don't see each other next week. And for any of us, I pray none of us are left behind in Jesus' name, but keep gathering. Let's keep worshiping Jesus. But the point is this, rapture, trials, the church still has to persevere. If we have forgotten that our call is to persevere, if we're like, well, God's going to get me out of here before it gets hard, it's already hard. That, like that train path, you know, anyone walking through some hard things in their lifetime, raise your hand if you walk through some trials. The promise of Christianity is not a problem-free, trial-free life. It's that through these trials, God's producing diamonds. Would you stand to your feet all over this place? And Lord, we cast it at your feet. God, thank you that we get to serve you. Lord, I pray that you would work in us, God. Renew us, change us, transform us, mature us. Let's just close our eyes all over this place. Lord, I pray that your word would read us would read our innermost thoughts, our secret thoughts, our fears, our hurts, our wounds, our shame. And God, that it would change us, that your word would change us from the inside out, Lord, that we would leave with a decision to apply what we've heard. This week, I pray, God, that you produce patience in us through life's unexpected twists and turns produce long-suffering, perseverance. I pray, God, that you would help us to walk with faith, not to be double-minded or doubtful, but, God, to believe that your promises are yes and amen. And if you promise to give us wisdom, you will. And you did promise to give us wisdom, and we believe you will deliver on that. We'll have wisdom for every trial we face. We'll have wisdom to navigate every situation, not in human logic or reasoning, but in the divine wisdom of God every relational issue, every career issue, every physical health issue, that we have wisdom in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today and you just need wisdom, you need help, you need God to produce some of these things we're talking about in your life, and you you have been walking through some things, whether you would call it a trial or a test or just a difficulty, But you're just saying, Holy Spirit, I want you to keep working in me. I want you to raise your hand across this room if that's you. Today you're saying, Lord, work in me what you need to do. Produce in me the change that you need to produce. God, help me through this trial with wisdom. If you need wisdom right now, just raise your hand. If you just need God's direction, you just need God's help, raise your hand. He's he's ready to give it to you. He says, I I see you and I want to help you. Secondly, you're here today and you go, Paul, I just need to get right with God. I need to surrender to Jesus. I need to repent. 
I need to let Jesus be Lord of my life today. If that's you, lift your hand today. God's knocking on the door of your heart. He's saying, let me in. Let me help you. Let me make things right between you and me. If you raised your hand or you wanted to raise your hand or you just need prayer, would you leave your seat? Come and join me at this altar. We're just going to worship for the next few minutes. We're going to let the Holy Spirit minister to you. We're going to let the wisdom of God just fall from heaven today in Jesus' name and spiritually just be deposited in our hearts today as we call out to God, as we ask God for his help. Go ahead, lead us in that song, Jeremiah. The altar is open. If anybody needs God's help today, God's wisdom, God's strength, just come down to the altar and receive it by faith today. Ask God. James says all you have to do is ask and God will give it to you. us. God, I thank you, Lord. You walk with us. You hold our hand like a good father. And you lead us through life's trials. And you lead us into triumph. You lead us into victory from glory to glory, from strength to strength. 
God, I thank you, Lord, that the pressure we're walking through is producing power, that it is producing real change in our hearts, growth and maturity and character and faith and joy. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're doing something good behind the scenes, even when we don't see it, even when we can't feel it. You are doing something good. And Lord, I pray, God, for your your wisdom today to be imparted to every person that's asking for wisdom, direction. I thank you that you give it, God. You are a good father. You are faithful. Lord, we put our trust in you, not in our feelings, not in our own understanding, but in you. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus, thank you for working in me. Thank you that you're not finished with me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for raising from the dead. Lord, I confess, I need you. I repent of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, lead me into truth. Guide me, counsel me. Lord, I ask you for wisdom and I receive it by faith that I have your wisdom for every trial I face. God, I thank you that you're with me and you lead me into victory. In Jesus' name.